I was awoken about 2 p.m. last Thursday from a drunken stupor because some idiot was banging on my front door. I dragged myself off the floor and opened the door just to... No. No. No, Hemholtz. No. Will you let me finish my story? I opened the door to find the DHL delivery man. No, I didn't get punched in the face. I was delivered this SMSL G1 clock. It should come as no surprise to anyone that all those bits of sound, the ones and zeros that come into the DAC at nearly the speed of light isn't music yet. It needs to be controlled and sent out with the correct timing. Otherwise, what you would hear would be this. And no one wants to hear that. Luckily for you, all internal DACs have a built-in clock. How good is the clock depends on your DAC. The worse the internal clock, the worse the timing of the release of the music, something that is measured as jitter. In advanced setups, say you're editing a video and you have multiple products where the audio and video need to be in sync. An external clock might be quite important because each product will be using the exact same clock, keeping them all in sync. It's one of the reasons the G1 has four outputs. But this channel is about consumer audio, not professional audio, where most of you will be using an external clock in just one product, your DAC. I know some of you are going to say you have an old CD player you use as a transport, and an external clock will be a big upgrade because it can hook up to your new DAC. Well, unless your new DAC sucks, it won't matter because all the newer DACs will re-clock the signal from the transport even if it has a lot of jitter in the signal to start with. So for consumer level use, the only real advantage is to connect it to one product, your DAC. I know, wait, you own the shit Yggdrasil, if I'm saying that right, V2 DAC. And on Audio Science Review, you saw this terrible graph. Surely an external clock could help fix that. After all, you spent over $2,400 for this DAC. Well, the answer is no and no. The first no is because, well, the B and C input on the shit isn't for an external clock. But let's just say it was. The answer is still no. Audio Science Review is doing a J test, not giving a jitter score. Whenever you see a bad J test on Audio Science Review or, or sites like it, the issue usually is caused with some internal component not the clock that is screwing up the audio output signal. In this instance, Amir points out the problem being the power supply. The internal clock is simply not going to be the problem. So no, the G1, even if there was an input for an external clock, would not fix this shit, whatever you call it. Luckily, the SMSL G1 clock is priced at a modest $529. That's modest in audiophile terms. So you better believe this keeps great timing. So good, it's spec that unknown femtoseconds. Yes, a dedicated audiophile clock that for consumer use is not giving you the one spec that is more important than all other specs when it comes to a clock. I asked multiple times, but I couldn't get the answer. Yes. SMSL states they're using the more expensive oven-controlled crystal oscillator, which is plus or minus 3 BBB and at 1 hertz is spected at negative 105 dBc phase noise. But they emit the phase noise at other frequencies, which leaves you just guessing what is the actual jitter. Are we going to have to listen? Hooking up an external clock requires a product that accepts an external clock. What you might have shockingly noticed is that as you go up the price range, 
the more likely you are to see an external clock input on a device. The audiophiles out there will simply think that as you get better and better, these wonderful companies are giving you an option to make their fantastic products sound even a little bit better. The skeptics will think that as you go more upmarket, shouldn't these expensive DACs have better built-in clocks, negating the need for such things? How little the skeptics understand audiophilia. So I took a look at the back of my Eversolo DMP A10, and there is no clock input. What the hell is going on? I called Eversolo and asked how they could admit, omit such an important option on a $3,000 plus product. They responded by saying the internal clock on the DMP A10 is specced at under 50 femtoseconds and no external clock can improve on that performance. I said, wouldn't under 20 FS be an improvement? This is why you don't want to get into an argument with a scientific audiophile. I'm just too smart and savvy. After hearing silence on the other end of the phone for a few seconds, Google Translate picked up what I thought was gibberish and translated it as the fool doesn't know when he can't hear a difference. Whatever Solo doesn't understand is that audiophilia is not always about improving the sound. It's the perception of believing you are improving the sound. Ever Solo better up the understanding of audiophilia or they're not going to be long for this world. Luckily, I do have a desktop DAC amp, the Aeon S9C Pro, which has a jitter spec of 594FS and has an external clock input. Well, SMSL isn't giving me, at least at this point in time, a jitter spec. Based on the specs it does give, I think we can safely assume the jitter is well below 200FS, if not below 50. So a significant improvement on the Aeon. Therefore, the G1 is better on paper. No, my furball friend, I don't. What I mean by on paper is that there is no question the G1 has a lower jitter spec than the built-in S9C clock. But even I, self-proclaimed greatest audiophile in all history, cannot hear below 1,000 femtoseconds. A study conducted by Benjamin and Gannon in 1998 found that the lowest level of jitter audible to train listeners was approximately... 10 nanoseconds. That's 10 million femtoseconds. But you should be aware that study didn't include me. So you can safely say 1,000 femtoseconds is the threshold of human hearing. And if no one can hear below 1,000 FS, and the EU and S9C is rated at 594 FS, then an external clock simply won't do anything. So why does Aeon include an external clock input? Could it be they make an external clock? It can't be that big of a profit margin though. These companies aren't trying to sell you snake oil. They're trying to improve your musical experience. They're all altruistic companies. They're not like big oil or healthcare. But this is the power of audiophile marketing. Give someone a better number and they will simply assume they can hear a difference because if lower jitter is better, then I want lower jitter. More importantly, many of your customers will insist they can hear a difference and be happy with their purchase. You can simply remark that their system must not be resolving enough. Go get better headphones or speakers and then come back and talk to us. Now let's take a closer look at the G1. The front is cleaner than an Apple product, machined beautifully in white. A small, unobtrusive blue light appears when the product is on. It blinks for a bit until it gets its full warm-up period, and then it goes solid blue. In the rear, you'll see four BNC output connectors. Should you have multiple products that allow an external clock, you won't need to buy a G1 for each product you own. Then we have the AC input. The built-in power supply is a nice addition, something SMSL 
has been adding to all the recent products. Then you might notice the DC input and scratch your head. What is the DC input for? Well, just imagine you paid all this money for the G1 and you have a dirty, noisy AC line. Sure, you could waste your money on an exotic power cable like Cheap Audio Man might recommend. But why would you buy a boring cable when you can add a Kesey's P6 6 amp linear power supply to send clean DC to two different products? If you want to use the AC input on the G1, you're a Nicholas Tesla fan. If you want to spend another $549 for the Kesey's, you're a Thomas Edison fan. Now those of you paying attention to this video should be getting a good understanding of the power of audiophilia on certain individuals. That companies can convince you that a quality product, and the G1 is a quality product, needs an external clock is impressive enough. But to convince you that your new external G1 clock could use an external linear power supply is phenomenal. Separating rich idiots from their money should not be frowned upon. It should be celebrated. Even more audiophile is the G1 recommends a 10-minute warm-up period before you actually start using the clock. You thought you were ready to sit down and listen to music? <laughs> no, sir. Turn on your clock and then get your bottle of wine. Hell, you might be so drunk by the time you start track one that, yes, it does sound better. But there's a caveat here. The G1 has no power button. So if it's plugged in, chances are it's been on for days, weeks, months, or years. So 10 minutes shouldn't be a worry for anyone. But I'm not going to let science get in the way of science. I decided I would put these golden ears to the test by doing a blind test between the G1 and simply using the Ayun's S9C Pro with its internal clock. Using the AC power supply with the G1, not the DC. And Hemholtz was in charge. My exceptional Dan Clark headphones were on and we began. Now the first blind test was a disaster. It so happened that Hemholtz here thought he'd be funny and actually play Yoko Ono music, which scrambled the clock so badly on both the Ayun and the SMSL, we had to factory reset them both. So 30 minutes later, I started the second test with Diane Bish's greatest hits because the Ayun will automatically pick up on the external clock signal. Hemholtz would simply plug or unplug in the BNC cable and with him noting if the clock icon was on or off, when I noticed a difference in the sound, he would write down if the clock icon was on or off. We didn't do this five times. We didn't do it 10 times. We did it 1,000 times. And what did this ultra scientific blind test conclude? Well, maybe this G1 clock has some real merit because I believed the G1 clock sounded better while using it with the Ayun S9C Pro 504 times. That's right, 504 times is a huge number. Just imagine you listen to music 1,000 times over the course of, say, a year. And 504 times, you got more pleasure because you hooked up the G1 clock. That's a lot of extra enjoyment that you never would have had had you not added the G1 to your system. So we have a product that does exactly what the company says it does. It keeps excellent timing. We also have a product that does absolutely nothing in terms of making the music you love sound any better. So how do you rate such a product? Easy. We start with an Oceana Chardonnay, a non-alcoholic wine that does exactly what it promises. Nothing. And then, of course, we pair it with a bowl of glass noodles and water chestnuts. Two foods that do exactly what they say they'll do. Nothing. They taste like nothing.
show a person one product that encapsulated the world of audiophilia, it is the master clock. Unless you have an old, terrible DAC that you want to make sound better with a $529 purchase, instead of getting an excellent DAC amp from SMSL for that much or even less, it has zero acoustic benefits in a consumer audio system. Now, if you're a music or video producer and have four different products and need them to be in all perfect sync, yes, the G1 will give you that peace of mind. But for consumer level audio, you'll have to use your psychoacoustic powers to hear a difference because your ears won't. That's all for this edition of the Scientific Audiophile. Thank you for watching and have a great day.